I'm D21Beast, and welcome back to Project Geek Week. With me this week, I've got Greg. Hey there. And i got JT. Hey, how's it going? Alright guys, so let's go ahead and get things started with the first thing that we're going to talk about today, the Mission Impossible Rogue Nation trailer. Um, now, I've not been a person who's watched Mission Impossible all the way through. Um, I was definitely in third grade. In all the movies. All the movies, yeah. yes. Because I was going to say, I've seen the first one, right? Um, but I don't, I don't think I've seen all the rest of them, so yeah. And it's a franchise that's been around for a while. Yes. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I was in third grade when the first movie yeah. came out. Like, this, is, <laughs> yes. this is a series that's been going. But um, I missed a couple of the films in the middle, but I definitely saw the first one, I saw the second one, and I saw Alpha, or Ghost, right? Yeah, Ghost Protocol. Protocol. Uh -huh. I saw Ghost Protocol, and I really enjoyed Ghost Protocol. So, uh, talking about Rogue Nation, I didn't know what to expect from this trailer. I haven't been following the story at all. Uh, but the didn't trailer, expect Simon Beck. Didn't expect him. Well, you know, and I was surprised, too. I, I don't know if he joined the franchise at a certain movie. I think he was in... Three and Ghost Protocol. Okay, I remember from Ghost Protocol. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. kind of like the the Q of yes, Ghost Protocol, yes. so he does all the inventions. Gotcha. So, um, but yeah, it's cool to see him in there. Uh, Jeremy Renner's in there. Alec Baldwin's in there. Of course, Tom Cruise is back as Ethan Hunt. The only name that they announced in the trailer was Tom Cruise. Like, yeah, that's true. Right? All these other people, and it was like Tom Cruise. Yeah, <laughs> it's like we, we saw Alec Baldwin. We saw. Anyway. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, the cast <laughs> is great. This, this is definitely a Tom Cruise vehicle, though. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, so my overall impressions of the trailer are positive. I like the idea the trailer kind of sets up that there's an anti-IMF and that the, you know, IMF is trying to take down, what was her name, uh, Syndicate? Syndicate. Yeah, yeah, Syndicate. yeah, the Syndicate. So, um, really enjoy the trailer, and there is definitely a money shot at the end of this trailer. Now, if you guys remember during Ghost Protocol, uh, there was a shot where Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt had to climb the tallest building in the world in Dubai. Yes. Now, if you don't know the production on that film, he actually was strapped to the top of this building, so when they did that shot over the head of him with the ground bump below him, Totally real. Yeah. I mean, he actually put himself out there to do this shot. And at his kind of, age. At his true. age, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, at his mysterious age, you can't tell by the way he looks. Yeah. But, so, he definitely looked to top himself in uh, this, this trailer, or this movie. So, it was really cool to see him strapped to the side of an airplane as it took off. Yes. I mean, that was just absolutely insane. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, overall, I think the energy of this movie trailer is really awesome. Uh, I wasn't really expecting or anticipating this movie, uh, even though I really enjoyed the last one. But I'm definitely looking forward to... Um, Man, I keep forgetting the name now. Rogue Nation. Rogue Nation Mission yeah. Impossible Rogue, Na Rogue Nation. I think it's going to be a really great film. So, yeah. Greg, let's get your thoughts on the trailer. Yeah, I mean, uh, as someone who's not really followed the Mission Impossible movies, it was uh, it was a good good to see the return to what I remember, I guess. Yeah. Without being uh, too different. And yeah, I didn't expect Simon Pegg. That was a nice surprise. Um, I, I, I look forward to seeing it. I need to see more. But at this point, yeah, I'm eager, I would say. Awesome. And JT, what do you think? Uh, coming off of Ghost Protocol, I think it's going to be great. Uh, it was kind yeah. of blindsided, though. I wasn't expecting a Mission Impossible this year. So, right, yeah. Uh, I mean, with all these other blockbuster movies coming out, we got Star Wars, we got Avengers, we have uh, Jurassic World, uh, of course, Bond, and then Mission Impossible, another huge action movie. So this, this summer and later this year is going to be just chock full of great movies, and I'll definitely be going to see it. So. Well, and it's interesting, too, that you mentioned you didn't expect this movie. If you don't know, uh, Rogue Nation was originally supposed to come out around Christmas. But they moved it because, you know, there's a certain Disney film coming out this December that's probably going to own the box office. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Star Wars, if you guys don't know what we're talking about. So, they actually moved that movie up six months. Apparently, they were so far ahead of production, their studio is confident enough with the film, that they said, let's go ahead and just make this a summer movie. So, wow. that's why marketing is just all of a sudden there for this thing. Awesome. So, yeah. So, I think we're all excited and we can't wait for it. Uh, on the topic of movie news... We actually had our first look at the Deadpool costume this week. Yes. So, uh, Jay, you had the tweet pulled up from uh, Ryan Reynolds. Go oh, ahead yeah. and read to us. And I'm putting the image now of the tweet up, guys. But go ahead and read to us what that tweet says. With great power comes great irresponsibility. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think he ended up putting another tweet, too, where he talks about how no bears are harmed in the image, or in the making of this image. But yeah, with the bear rug. I yeah. <laughs> so, so, I couldn't tell. Is it CGI? Like, it looks like it might have at least enhancement. I it think... does kind of look like it has CGI enhancement. Yeah. yeah. I think they're planning to shoot this live action, and I guess talking about our thoughts on the costume, and Jamie, maybe you recognize this too, that's not comic book Deadpool, that's the Deadpool from the Activision game from like two years yes, ago, right? it is. It yeah. just like that. And granted, that was the Deadpool too that was um, in the, the concept trailer that leaked last year. Yes. So I don't know what came first production-wise, the look of the Deadpool game or the concept trailer and the way Deadpool looked in that, but I think there's a lot of similarities between those two outfits, so it's interesting yeah, it to go is. with that particular one. It doesn't even... It doesn't even resemble the one he had in the Wolverine movie either. It's well, no, and kind I kind of like thankfully. You know, yeah, that was kind <laughs> of a bad costume, but like 
I, I, it's it's Deadpool. Oh, it's totally I mean, Deadpool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and it almost looks like too, if you look at the image again, it looks like one eye, his right eye maybe, is a little bit bigger than his left eye, kind of like he's half closing yeah, eye. Yeah. Deadpool kind of makes faces like that frequently in the comic books. So. Yeah. But I love the humor behind the image. Oh yeah. Um, I mean. <laughs> Deadpool is going to try to seduce you with his, his goods, right? And yeah. So he, he's giving it all there. And his I'm, goods I'm, and his mouth. And his mouth, yeah. So uh, certainly inspires confidence in the movie. Great. Oh, what yeah. did you think of the costume? Uh, the costume looks great. Um, I'm curious. You, I remember you talking about this previously, that Ryan Reynolds has been very involved personally yes. with the development of both this movie. I, do you know if he had anything to do with the game? I don't think he did, no, honestly. I'm I think that was curious. completely innocent. So this is a coincidence that yeah. they yeah. look so similar. Uh, I, I didn't know if the game was... I remember you talking about how this movie was has been in production for a while, or at least been in pre-production for yes. a while. Um, and that uh, maybe it was started around the same time as that game? I mean, it, honestly, it could have been. I Again, I don't have the numbers or the dates or anything in front of me, but I think uh, that concept trailer was at least written roughly 2012 or maybe even 2011, sometime yeah. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob Liefeld, who invented Deadpool, and you know he first appeared in New Mutants and then went on to other books, he's actually been talking about the Deadpool movie for a while now, too. And I think there was a comic book convention several years ago, and again, guys, I'm sorry I don't have dates or any links for you, but um, he was, he's was he been talking about it for a while, and he's, he knew what the content footage was going to show before that trailer was ever done. So it's possible that Activision, that movie, maybe they thought it was canned at the moment, and they took the assets or pre-production art and put it for the game. I don't know how that all lines up, yeah. but it, it's interesting to know how similar that look of Deadpool is to the yeah. High Moon Activision game. I also haven't played the game fully, at least. I think I played a little bit of it when you brought it over, but... Uh, do you know story-wise if it's going to align at all? Or? I don't think we know anything about story at this point. No. In fact, we're still wondering what year this movie takes place because yeah. the X-Men reboots that are going on right now are set in the past. Uh, Deadpool, the last time we saw him, was in the 1970s. So it could be the same Deadpool. I mean, it'd be funny if it was the same yeah. Deadpool. He'd have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> you know, he showed up in the the apocalypse era, but we also don't know if Singer's sticking around with X-Men post-apocalypse. Is it going to suddenly move to the 90s or the present? So yeah. really, Deadpool coming out first next year is going to be very telling of what what the tone is, or maybe what the, the era is for both that film and, and other films. You might get an idea of when Gambit's going to be set, which doesn't even come out until September of next year. Yeah. So um, lots to still learn about this movie, but production is, is happening right now. They're filming now, the thing's written, so... We're going to start getting stuff probably around Comic-Con that'll give us a better idea of when this film's set and yeah, what it's about. I think about. it gives us a good place setter for it. So, well, moving on then with other movie news, um, this is completely rumor at this point, but it's being reported by Variety and by IGN that Idris Elba is in talks to play the villain in Star Trek III. So, Idris Elba, first of all, if you don't know him, he was in Thor and Thor the Dark World, he was in Pacific Rim. I didn't see Pacific Rim, but he was a general, I think, in that movie. Mm -hmm. I've seen it, but it didn't, I don't really remember him much in that movie. Yeah, okay. He was also in Mandela, The Long Walk to Freedom recently, and of course, most people, at least across the pond, will know him from the BBC show Luther, uh, where he was the uh, eponymous character. So, uh, he's a great actor. I personally, personally first saw him first in The Office, when he played uh, the temporary boss that really hated Jim, which I thought was great. But um, he's, a, he's a really great actor, he's definitely a word caliber actor, and it's cool to see a guy with this sort of gravitas attached to Star Trek 3, potentially. Again, this is all rumor, it hasn't been confirmed yet. Um, I guess maybe we want to wonder who he's playing. Uh, I have my thoughts. Um, why don't you go ahead and share, Greg, your thoughts first on who you think somebody like that might be, knowing that maybe the Klingon war is potentially the it's story true. of the third movie. Like, Klingons could definitely be a big player. Um... I know that they set that up with Star Trek 2, although toward the end it seems like they kind of abandoned it. But if they were going to get things back on track, I think him being a big Klingon villain would be uh, would make sense. Core. He could be a core. He could also be like at least uh, the the timeless throughout history Klingon villain has been the Duras family. Well, that's true. That'd be um, fantastic. Yeah. So he could be involved with the Duras. Uh, if he's not going to be a Klingon, he could be somebody like Richard Daystrom. Oh, or okay, yeah. Else who comes in? But that would be—he wouldn't be a villain in that case. He'd be more like a, I don't know, a, an accessory to the villain, which is this kind of out of control computer. Sure. But yeah. What are, you, what are your ideas? My ideas. Yeah. Well, my ideas are obviously core. Um, that was originally not by John Kalikos, who played Core. Yeah, that's right. Was it John Kalikos? Okay, yeah. So it was Day of the Dove that we first saw Core, so kind of our first introduction. Uh, that was uh, actually Kang. Kang. Kang was yeah. in Day of the Dove. Okay. Uh, so Core was in the Organia episode, the name escapes me right now. Okay, well, I see, I know Core better from Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. But, um, so anyway, it would just be interesting if they kind of played out that whole, like, first encounter with the Klingons or the, the Klingon War. Now, the, and maybe you have thoughts on this too, Jay, uh, it's cool that Idris Elba is attached. But I also feel like that's a, possibly a detriment to the film. I think Star Trek is best when there's not a big bad villain. And if we're going to get away from the maniacal villain attacking Earth, attacking the ship, 
we need a villain that's more nebulous. Yeah. Something like a doomsday machine. Yeah. Or something like a planetary virus that they can't figure out what's going on. That's where Richard Daystrom could be a great well, person to true. have. Because yeah. basically there's just this out of control computer. The Enterprise itself becomes the villain. Well, okay, and, yeah. You know, something along those lines. But I, I doubt they would go that direction just in a big budget movie because nobody's going to know who that is and you're not going to make a, a lasting property out of uh, the, the MI5 computer. So, yeah. yeah. And what do you think yeah. as far as him being attached to the movie? I, I don't know. It's another big name that, you know, just kind of get thrown in there. I mean, he's done so much with being Hondo. And then he, yeah. he also is on a campaign to be a Green Lantern. So, oh, um, is he? Okay. Yeah, so he, I think he wants to play Jon Stewart. So I, I don't know where we well, got that going on. But um, I, I, I think he's, he, he's a very strong actor. And bringing his presence to a, a, a film like Star Trek Three. Um, this point in the game, I don't know if it's needed, but I mean, I know he can bring what he can bring to the table. I definitely see him as a Klingon. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of the the going thing here. And I, I was going to say that we're going to get into that point, but I definitely see him uh, kind of maybe sparking the Klingon more somehow. But okay. We'll see. So you'd like then maybe to have a villain versus a, a galaxy spanning threat? Would you like a villain? Uh, if it leads to something bigger, then yes. But if okay. it's not, if it's just him alone, no. I don't want. I don't want an uh, overall looming threat of just one guy. If it leads to him maybe sparking something, where if he dies, then all of a sudden the, the entire Klingon race is like, we gotta kill all these humans. We gotta take Earth out. We gotta kill everything. Let's yeah, go, something more politics involved. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Then, then yes. But uh, I don't want to just have one main villain. Set. They still yeah. need to find out what they want to do with this new Star Trek movie. Like, is this movie will determine for better or worse, the future of the Star Trek film franchise. Yep. So if they, if they did just another movie with a big bad villain that dies at the end, or doesn't die at the end and gets put in a jail or whatever, it's just, I, I don't feel like that would be enough for Star Trek. They yeah. really need to push some boundary, add some new uh, persistent threat that doesn't rely on just one person. Right, mm -hmm. right. We have not another one and done film. Yeah. So. All right, well, then uh, that's kind of our thoughts. I think we're all like the idea of interest attached. We just want to see more about what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, also moving on, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, but it's worth noting, Jennifer Lawrence has officially stated that she is not continuing with X-Men post-X-Men Apocalypse. Now, Jennifer Lawrence was in a much different place in her career at the start of the X-Men movies. Uh, she, ha she wasn't Katniss Everdeen yet. She didn't win a bunch of Oscars yet. So... Um, it's, it's time for her, I think, that she wants to move on. The Mystique makeup, of course, is terrible. So we know definitively now that after X-Men Apocalypse, if Mystique's sticking around, it's not going to be Jennifer Lawrence. So, I've been speculating that for a while, so yeah, no surprise. Yeah, no, doesn't surprise anybody. I mean, do you guys have any other thoughts on that? Nah, I just, just want to say thanks, Jennifer Lawrence. Well, yeah, yeah great job. <laughs> the one question would be, who do you think is going to take it up after her? Yeah, that's true. We'll have to see where Apocalypse ends. I mean, it's pretty hard to ignore the fact that Nightcrawler is now appearing in Apocalypse with Mystique. I don't want to see Mystique die. I don't think that would serve the character, um, especially if we're to believe that she's around in the future with Magneto potentially. So um, let's just have her have her story co story arc completed, and maybe just not have Mystique in the next X Men movie, and then maybe X Men. I don't even know if you can call it X Men Five, whatever the X Men First Class Five is. Maybe bring Mystique back if the story serves it. So, but let's yeah, give her a swan song, and then just kind of not have her maybe for a movie. And on the X Men tip, uh, Lana Condor has been cast as Jubilee. So, Brian Singer announced this over Twitter, that he found this uh, actress to play Jubilee. Um, let's see here. I have some thoughts on why she was cast. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what went on behind the scenes with X-Men Days of Future Past. One of the reasons that Fan Bingbing was added to the cast of the film was appeal to global markets. Mm -hmm. uh, Fan Bingbing is huge in China. I can't speak to that, but that's um, what I understand from all the, the trades that I read, is that she was a pretty big, pretty big actress. Uh, we know somebody from China, too, who even kind of confirmed that for us. So she was in the movie, basically, to put on the poster in other countries to help the, uh, the film out. And I think it honestly helped the film out, having such a global cast. I think this girl, Jubilee, first of all, is kind of a weird fit. Now, granted, she did originally join the X-Men in the 1980s, at least in our time. Uh, but we have already seen Jubilee in X-Men 1, 2, and 3, played by Kai Wong, and I forget the other girl's name. Um, well, it's not immediately here in front of me, Katrina but Lawrence. Uh, Katrina Lawrence, there we go. So it's interesting that she played, she was in X-Men 1 and 2 and 3 as like a 16, 17 year old girl. And if we're to believe that the X-Men Apocalypse takes place in the 1980s, she would be what, two? You know, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> it's kind of weird that they're hiring this, this actress that appears to be between 15 and 18 to play Jubilee in X-Men Apocalypse. So, Unless the timeline's going to be completely different. Unless the timeline's completely different and Jubilee's born way earlier. I know, 
I don't know that they ever actually called that girl Jubilee. Maybe in X2 at some point they call her Jubilee. I can't recall. But she definitely cameoed in all three movies. And she was wearing the yellow coat, and she had the sunglasses on her head. She was definitely supposed to be Jubilee. Yeah. So I'm curious to see how the, all that plays out. But I definitely think this is a move, too, to kind of appeal to global markets. And maybe that's a good idea because it worked out for Days of Future Past. Uh, Jay, what are your thoughts on her being added to the cast? Um, no name actress. I'm kind of in the mysterious phase of she could be awesome or she could be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just kind of want to see what she brings to the table. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Jubilee actually, like, be in the X-Men because we haven't seen Jubilee. We've seen uh, Cat and we've seen Rogue as young people, but we haven't seen, you know, the other, like, main predominant young girls um, be in the in the films. And then they even pulled Rogue's, uh, Rogue's role out of the last movie. So, yeah. um, I mean, that kind of left us with, a, with an empty void. I mean, we got Cat, we got Shadow Cat, but we didn't get, like, her as, you know, as predominantly as we think we sh as we should have seen. Um, so Jubilee coming in, I think is going to be cool. Um, where where she's going to fit, I don't know. How she's going to fit in with, I know her and uh, Logan kind of have that right. like you know brother sister type deal going on. So I want to see how that kind of plays into the whole uh, apocalypse. In so we'll see how it goes. Okay, and, and what are your thoughts, Greg? Uh, obviously, Brian Singer must be pretty confident if he found this actress that he's never seen before. She must have done a really great audition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's so confident he's putting it out there on Twitter, right? So it's like, what are we supposed to think at this point? I mean, you don't know anything about her. Is it possible she's just another cameo? Uh, I, why would he... Hmm, I don't know. I, I would I mean, say I guess it wouldn't be worth promoting it on Twitter, right? Yeah. If it was just a yeah. cameo. Yeah, so he's got plans for her, I guess. Mm -hmm. So It's possible he's wanting to move into a more FOH, like... Mutant, well, I mean, with, you, with the whole Civil War thing happening, maybe we'll see more of that. Oh, okay. Different universes, but maybe you'll want to do kind of mutant registration type thing in his universe, too. Okay. And I know that's part of uh, Jubilee's struggle, is kind of remaining anonymous in her life. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and you know, maybe essentially they mentioned Prince and He-Man to the FOH. We kind of got the idea of the Mutant Registration Act in the first X-Men film, so maybe he could even be laying the seeds. Again, we don't know how much those movies are going to be the end effect of what's happening in the new current X-Men films. Yeah. But it'd be interesting if he kind of has the seeds planted at this point now and she kind of shows up. But yeah. I'll be surprised if we don't immediately get introduced, or if we aren't introduced to her first in a shopping mall. Because that's how the X-Men met, met her in the comics. Oh, yeah. That's how they met her in the 92 animated series. I bet we're going to see this girl in a mall at some point. Mm -hmm. So uh, that'll be kind of fun. But uh, moving on, so we're kind of done with our movie news. Uh, we had a topic that just kind of showed up in the last 24 hours, really. Uh, there was a comic book that was announced for Free Comic Book Day called All New Avengers. And I'm putting the image of the comic book cover up on the screen right now. But it's interesting to take a look at the lineup. Now, Marvel has not really said anything definitive about this team, but the general assumption seems to be that this is going to be our Avengers post-Secret War, at least one of the Avengers teams we have, All New Avengers. And as we look at the roster of the team, we've got uh, the female Thor, we've got the Kamala Khan version of Miss Marvel, We've got the uh, Sam, and I forget his last name all the time, but Sam. Wilson. Sam Wilson? Uh, oh, well, the Falcon. Okay, you're, you're on Falcon. Um, we've got the Sam Wilkin, Captain Falcon, Falcon. We've got Nova, who is the Sam version of Nova, and I can't remember his last name. We have Vision. We have Iron Man, who is, seems to be back in the red and gold, not wearing the white superior Iron Man armor. So uh, maybe we're going to lose the inversion that we've been reading about in uh, Uncanny Avengers. Uh, we've got the Miles Morales Spider-Man, which is very interesting. And I think that's the entire lineup there. So I guess we have a very sort of multi-cultured Avengers team that also seems to echo the thoughts of the movies that are going out right now, different characters who've been announced for different movies. Um, Greg, let's go ahead and start with your opinion of the cover and what it might mean for the Avengers and Marvel comic books moving forward. Well, yeah, so uh, when we first started talking about this, I don't think either of you guys were thinking about MCU uh, applications right. here. And since I don't really follow the comics, that was kind of my first thought. It's like, okay, how are these guys going to fit in with what's going on in the movies? Uh, so obviously we've got Sam Wilson set up uh, as uh, Falcon, and he can take over for Captain America. I've been thinking for a while, and I think you would agree, that uh, Chris Hemsworth is probably not going to be around for a whole lot more movies. Yeah. So it's possible they could transition into a she Thor, a uh, female Thor. Um, we haven't seen a Miss Marvel or a Captain Marvel in the movies yet. It's possible they could introduce it as uh, the younger Miss Marvel. Um, or maybe we'll see both of them in Guardians 2 or something like that. Um, I don't know, I guess, enough with Iron Man. Um, is it always Tony Stark who's Iron Man? Uh, there was, I think, a couple of times where Rhodey stood in for Stark. Uh, well, I know uh, during Demon, or post-Demon and Abomin, maybe, 
Uh, Rhodey actually wore the Iron Man armor for a little bit while Tony was recovering. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's just been like, well, Tony and Iron Man got to appear in two places at once. Well, Rhodey's going to put the armor on, so people aren't, you know, that was back when his identity was a secret. So, what I'm typically thinking, speaking, though, it's Tony. Well, what I'm thinking with that is that we know that Downey's not going to be doing more Iron Man. And well, we, we know that he's attached for at least two more Avengers movies. Well, he's not going to do any standalone Iron Man. Yes. You're correct, um, yeah. And it's possible, like, I, if this is the new wave of Avengers, basically, so after we get done with this Avengers cycle. Oh, uh, you're thinking, yeah. like, Phase 4 or Planet. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like, who is who is going to be Iron Man when Downey's done? Yeah. And, and if it has to still be Tony Stark, they'll either have to essentially reboot Tony Stark or not do that, have it be somebody who isn't Tony. Well, that's an interesting time, idea. That's a great season. concept, I think. Yeah, yeah, and actually, let me interject there yeah. really quick. Um, I was kind of talking to Jay about this. I don't know if you guys remember, uh, before Spider-Man One More Day ever happened, uh, we had an issue on Free Comic Book Day of Spider-Man that was drawn by um, a DC artist who had been exclusive to uh, DC for a long time, Bill Jimenez. He came and drew an issue of Spider-Man, and it was actually written by either Zeb Wells or Dan Slott, one of the newer Spider-Man writers. And the issue was very strange to Marvel fans because in this storyline, Peter Parker wasn't married to Mary Jane. He wasn't an Avenger. Uh, this new villain named Mr. Negative was introduced. Everything in Spider-Man's universe was the same, but a lot was different, too. He was working at the Bugle again, just being a photographer. He wasn't a teacher. And it was a really sort of fun one-off issue of Spider-Man that happened on this free comic book day. I want to say it was 2007, 2008, sometime not too long, or, two, or around Civil War around there. And uh, while we all enjoyed the book, at least everyone I talked to, we all just kind of scratched our heads like, what continuity was this pulled from? It almost seemed like an other world Spider-Man story. Well, it turned out about a year later, Spider-Man One More Day happens, and suddenly everything in this book was the status quo that we had just read on Free Comic Book Day. We just didn't know we were reading Spider-Man One More Day yet. Yeah. Yeah. So Marvel kind of was, I think, secretly trying to test the waters, and if the book totally bombed, maybe editorially they were going to make some changes to what they were doing with Spider-Man. But since everyone liked the status quo, even though we didn't know what we were reading, yeah. they're like, well, let's push ahead with one more day. People will like it. We'll just have to, you know, put it out four times a month, which they did. Put it out four times a month for the next six months, and uh, <laughs> many people will just kind of, like, ram it down their throats that this is the new Spider-Man, so they have to get used to it. So maybe this is a similar idea. Uh, they're putting out this book that might potentially be a Phase 4, uh, a taste of Phase 4 Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's also going to be the new team in the comic books to kind of add to that corporate synergy that Marvel loves to have right now. So great point there, you know, suggesting that it's, Kind of tied to that. We've got obviously Vision here, and he's going to be premiering in Avengers Two. Yep. Um, Nova will probably see if Richard Rider or uh, the other guy in Guardians Two. Um, but the only, I guess, outlier there aside from Tony uh, is that we have Miles Morales Spider Man. Yes. Like, wasn't it already confirmed that Spider Man in MCU is going to be Peter Parker? One Sony exec, and we said his name on a show a couple weeks back, did say that this is Peter Parker's story. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been conflicting reports online recently that maybe he spoke out of turn, mm -hmm. or maybe you know there's other things going on and that we might potentially have a different Spider-Man. I hope Sony. that's true, because we've seen yeah. Peter Parker so many times. Yeah, yeah we really <laughs> have. I mean, there, there was a casting rumor this week of a guy who was like 16, he happened to be white, and they were saying, oh, this guy's the front runner. But again, we, nothing is confirmed yeah. at all. So, um... We could very well still be looking at a Miles Morales with the Sony version of the Spider-Man movie. I would just say, a bit to kind of wrap up my thoughts on this cover, if this were to be the next phase of Avengers, I'd be okay with that. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I can see that too. <laughs> would you, would you, if you were Sony and, or Marvel, would you put Peter Parker in first so he could be a part of the original Avengers team, so he could actually be yeah, with Steve Rogers, Tony Stark, and you know, and uh, Bruce and everybody? And then put Miles in as the new team kind of forms? Like, would this be the set for the new team after the original team kind of maybe disappears before Infinity Wars, and then the original team comes back in Infinity Wars? I don't know how you, you know, how you kind of play that. Maybe these guys take over as the Avengers for a while after Civil War in between there's, until Infinity Wars comes out. And there's certainly time for uh, Sony to do a couple Peter Parker movies before... Avengers Next Wave or whatever Avengers uh, sure. yeah. comes up. So yeah, I could see them doing that. What if they, and this may not be a thing at all, but what if part of the agreement with Sony is that Marvel gets to use Peter Parker, but Sony's movies or standalone movies may be Miles Morales films, or maybe they'll introduce him, yeah. and eventually 
through the Spider-Man Peter Parker films, the Spider-Man everyone's already comfortable with and familiar with, they kind of introduce and set up Miles to kind of be his own guy, and then maybe Peter Parker's Spider-Man shows up during the big events. Yeah. I don't know. So uh, mm -hmm. that could be way off. But yeah. I'm just trying to think, you know, especially with this image here, they're certainly trying to promote the diversity that their team can have. Yeah. And I know a lot of people have been complaining and critical of the fact that Marvel's movie com movies coming out so far have been all... Um, all Frankly, white people. White people, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, I for one, I was happy to see Falcon in in, uh, in the Winter Soldier. I was happy yeah. to see him kind of take a role. And then they were really like playing up uh, T'Challa and and they were. Black Panther. And so, I mean, I I me, I'm fulfilled with those main characters like kind of coming in, and I, I'm I'm cool with a big spectrum of characters too. Like I, I think we. We definitely need more than one female character because all we have right now in the movies is black. Black Widow, yeah. So, and I'm, I'm I'm seeing that, and I know Joss Whedon has been more than happy to write a strong female lead uh, role. So, sure. I mean, I, I want to see more of that kind of happen, but I'm not mad at white guys. I'm not mad at black <laughs> guys. I just want to see everybody kind a of good come team, together. Good story. Yeah, yeah, get it get it all together and, and really kind of build build it together. And, and they've done a fantastic job with the characters they've had so far. So I think adding more characters and just kind of putting them in piece by piece is going to be the key. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. think throwing it all in one pot at the very beginning is going to be the, the way to go. I think getting the, the team you have established, getting them to a point where they just are at the point, we don't want to do this anymore, here's the new guys, let them yeah. take over type deal. I don't, I don't want to see it kind of clash. So as long as, as, the, as, long as they write it correctly, I, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. So and I guess a couple more points before we move on. Um, I do want to mention this appears to be the free comic book day Avenger book. So we will probably be picking up that book and reviewing it on a future show. So you guys can look forward to that. The other thing I want to mention too is we are already reviewing Uncanny Avengers. We'll have another review next week. Uh, Vision and Captain Falcon... <laughs> Uh, they are both on that team, yes. so I'm curious to know post Secret War what's going on with Uncanny Avengers. It looks like the team may be having a bit of a shakeup. Mm -hmm. So uh, other stuff to look forward to there. So while we're talking about comic books, let's go ahead and move on to Aquaman number 40. Now I've left the uh, the comic book off the table here, but I'm going to put an image of the cover up on the screen here. Um, I actually picked up uh, the Free Willy variant cover yes. version <laughs> of uh, Aquaman. Now if you haven't been following that, uh, just as a quick side here. Uh, Throughout the month of March, Warner Brothers has been doing movie homage posters in all their comics. We've had a 2001 Space Odyssey uh, Green Lantern. We had Purple Rain Batgirl. We had um, lots of different covers. Uh, there were some pretty good ones out there. I'm not remembering all of them right now. But basically, every superhero title they've got had some sort of cover. Oh, uh, Dead Man, or was it Justice League Dark? They had a, uh, a Beetlejuice cover. <laughs> Dead cool. Man was Beetlejuice. <laughs> so, I mean, they've done some really, really cool things. If you guys haven't seen those, definitely Google those images. But anyway... First of all, let's talk about the cover of Aquaman 40. Did you guys like the homage to Free Willy? I loved it. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was done very, very well. Uh, but this issue of Aquaman was written by Jeff Parker. Uh, he's notable uh, for being a penciler, inker, letterer, colors. He's done everything that there is in the industry, so he's kind of a renaissance man in that front. His previous works include Agents of Atlas, Gamekeeper, and what I know him best from is the X-Men First Class comic book that really is not related at all to the movie X-Men First Class, but the book itself. And it's it was originally a 12-issue miniseries or a 6-issue miniseries and then became an ongoing series before X-Men First Class, the movie, ever came out. And just kind of retold the origin in present day of Scott, Gene, and Iceman and all those guys. So we had the X-Men playing Xbox 360 while they were not saying today. It's kind of an <laughs> interesting modern take. So I, I appreciated his writing there, and he's pretty funny. Art-wise, we had Paul Pelletier. Uh, his works include Green Lantern, Superman, Fantastic Four, She-Hulk, and The Exiles. And The Exiles, honestly, where I know him best from. Uh, that's where I got my first real introduction to Spider-Man 2099. So uh, I like his art. It's a little bit reminiscent of um, Alan Davis at times. So, uh, But anyway, overall, I thought the art in this book was really nice. Uh, the writing, for me, maybe was missing a little bit. Uh, this is the sixth issue in a series, and granted, that's probably not the best issue to jump in on, the one at the end of a story arc, but we were trying something new this week with Aquaman, getting a DC book in there. Um, I did feel a bit lost. Yeah, there was okay. a lot going on this yeah. issue. Uh, there was uh, Aquaman and Mera were there, which those are characters you might know if you have a passing interest in DC, but then apparently there was some sort of struggle or some sort of reveal of who Aquaman's mother might be, yeah. and there was this woman named Atlanta there that was swearing to be his mother, and a power struggle there that kind of ended with uh, Aquaman getting the throne of Atlantis back, it seemed like, by the yeah. end of it. Uh, there was a pretty interesting battle between a uh, water, we'll call it Titan, and uh, yeah. a magma Titan, and Mera was kind of controlling. A fire troll. A fire troll, okay, troll, yeah. we'll call it that. We'll call it water Titan and a fire troll, but Mera was, it had a pretty interesting battle with that, but yeah. overall, and again, maybe I jumped in at the wrong spot, but this book just didn't grab me. It seemed like a lot of noise. And then the book was over, and I was just like, well, I guess Aquaman's okay. 
Yeah. You know, that's kind of how it ended. What did you think, Jay? Um, I wanted to not really read more. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah I, I, see that. I, I just kind of was stuck in a place where I felt like I could go back and read it, but I don't really want to because it, I don't know, I, where did it start? And then Aquaman's mother kind of not really being a mother to him and like yeah. seeing him kind of go back like, you're my mom and you did all this and I don't need you anymore. And, <laughs> yeah. and you're just like, Aquaman, are you whining right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, shut up, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, be Aquaman. Right. Uh, you've always known Aquaman to be that kind of pompous, like, you know, prideful Atlantean that just doesn't really care. Yeah. You know what I mean, and this point, is, is, his emotions are kind of conflicted. And then his wife, oh my God, Mira, just kind of just took the reins and yeah, she really was the face. Hero, and I was yeah. like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, seeing someone else kind of control water and, and, and have her magic abilities kind of shine through was really cool. But other than that, you're right. It was just a bunch of noise, and I didn't really want to read more. I, I don't know. I, maybe it's just because I'm not a huge Aquaman fan either. Like, yeah. out of DC, I'm more of a Batman, um, like, Somewhat of a Superman, but I really, I really like Batman mostly, and I, I just really wasn't grabbed by it. All right, personally. well, yeah. And what, what did you think, Greg? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was completely confused throughout the whole issue. I had no idea what was going on. There were like giant monsters fighting each other, and everybody seemed really concerned about that. Um, yeah. The, there was a guy who died like halfway. Through well, that's true. Yeah. Who's yeah. That guy? Yeah. Did they even name him before he died? No, I, I think they think did. So, yeah. yeah. It just really did not seem... I mean, again, yeah, it's probably where we jumped in more than anything, but I had no attachment to anything that was happening, and it seemed all so significant to the story and the characters in the story that it didn't really resonate with me at all. I know a lot of times, I don't want to compare it to Marvel books, but even in Marvel books, they'll go back and say, previously. Yeah, they got a recap and, page. Yeah, they, there's definitely a recap, and there's something that tells you... Uh, even the, you know, the you get the the yellow letter boxes that tell you, okay, this is what happened, this is what's going on, this is where their state of mind is now. And you yeah. don't get that in this book. Yeah, it really and just so, kind of drops you in. Yeah, it drops you right in the middle. And I, I, me personally, I feel like at any point in any story, I don't care if it's a, a comic book or a novel you're reading, at any point, if you jump in the book, it should give you the urge to go back and read more or even read further into it. And at the end of this this book, you just sort of like, okay, it's done. Guess like, that yeah. Yeah, yeah, it happened. So uh, I, I feel like that was just kind of a misstep. And i got to say, just by comparison, um, last week we reviewed Ninja Turtles number 44. And, you know, granted, we all grew up with the 80s cartoon. We're familiar with the movies. Mm -hmm. But at any point during that book, I mean, you know, I've been reading off and on myself. I never felt like man, I just need to power through this so I can get to the end. And I kind of had that feeling reading this issue of Aquaman. Well, and that's a really interesting comparison, too, because the Turtles book was kind of similar in tone to this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. There was, like, lots of crazy stuffs going on, but it was just easier to parse. It was easier to, like, I didn't feel like as much of an outsider while reading yeah. the book. Yeah, yeah. And I was just jumping into that one. I yeah. didn't know anything about that story. So. That's the yeah. first Turtles I've read in a long time. Yeah. And I, I felt the same way, like, oh, I can go back and read what happened because holy crap, this is really good. Yeah. And yeah. I want to read the next issue. You know, like, that's kind of where yeah. I'm with yeah. it, so. Well, maybe we'll have to visit Aquaman again at another date, maybe on an issue that's the start of a story arc. <laughs> yeah. But I think, if anything, this is a testament to the fact that DC really needs to add recap pages because <laughs> I think that would have gone a long way to help us with that story. So, uh, next up, and I guess maybe we should have mentioned this during our TV section, a uh, quick hit here. It has been confirmed this week that Nerdist.com reported that uh, The X-Files is coming back to television. Now, if you're not familiar with The X-Files, it was a groundbreaking series that ran from 1993 to 2002. Supernatural investigations by the FBI. Uh, from a production standpoint, X-Files is notable for really bringing uh, film or television production, specifically science fiction television production, to Vancouver, Canada. Um, and now a lot of shows, Smallville, Arrow, Flash, pretty much anything on CW films in Vancouver now. And <laughs> they probably can owe that to X-Files. But uh, they did report that uh, Jillian Anderson, David Duchovny, and series creator Chris Carter are all on board to return. They're going to be coming back for six episodes this fall to air on Fox. They don't, have not announced a premiere date. But uh, pretty interesting, I think, to see that X-Files is coming back after, man, was it 13 years? So yeah. it, it's been a while. Yeah. Now, we had a movie in between, the X-Files I Want to Believe film, which I enjoyed, I guess, from... Um, a nostalgic point. It was kind of fun to see all those characters again. I haven't actually seen it. But it was also kind of a weird movie that very much 
uh, and I'll, I can really only compare it to other stuff I know. Uh, Star Trek Insurrection it had the idea of that movie was an interesting story, but it really seems like it could have been an extended yeah. episode. That's kind of the feeling I got from X Files. I want to believe, but mm. I'm curious about this six episode mini arc. It's very short, so yeah. I'm thinking it's going to be some sort of television event, maybe. Well, and I, I didn't watch the last couple seasons of X Files, but uh, from where I left off, I recall like uh, uh, Scully was pregnant with some alien baby, mm -hmm. and then it got or she, she got abducted or Mulder got abducted or something. But like it seemed like they never really resolved that, so it would be great if they can come back and kind of do a six episode series. Now that TV has moved past the whole episodic television era, yeah. they could come back and tell the six story episode run they wanted. They wanted to tell true. all along. True. Yeah, there's enough time to stretch out of twenty four episodes with yeah. a lot of filler. So. It would be good. Yeah, to actually get some closure on that series, and I'm sure it'll be in some attempt, like a way a way to launch maybe more shows. But sure. uh, if, if they had a very nice contained six episode run, I, I would be pleased with that. Okay, and Jay, as somebody who didn't really stick or you know watch X Files, yeah, I'm sure you understand its cultural relevance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does this encourage you at all to check it out, or you just kind of uh, wait and see approach? Yeah, I'll probably check it out. Um, I might go back and watch some episodes to maybe get up to speed on it. Uh, maybe just the key episodes that are recommended by you know fans and. Um, try to catch up on it and see if I can, you know, get it. I'm very familiar with David Duchovny. I mean, I, I've seen him do a lot of other things, and I've seen some of the other actors do some other things after that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm interested. I was always interested as a kid, just never really had the like means to sit down and watch it because no one else in my house watched it. See, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, we definitely grew up where our mom had it on every night. Yeah, you know, was it Friday nights that it came on, or something Saturday night, something like that? Yeah. It was, it was on. Days. Yeah, I'll show that too. So. <laughs> All right, well, moving on then. Um, this week in Geek TV, uh, let's talk about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So this week on S.H.I.E.L.D., we saw the return of Agent 33 and Ward for the first time since the season the series came back from break. Mm -hmm. uh, we also saw what Bobby and Mac have been up to. Um, I'd like to go ahead and speak first on this because I have some thoughts about what's going on with Bobby and Mac. Um, last week when they introduced the idea of a second S.H.I.E.L.D., I was a bit, I don't know, I'm going to say dubious about it because it just seemed like, why is there another S.H.I.E.L.D.? What does this mean? After this week's episode, they kind of shot a little bit more what the shield's about, but the big takeaway I'm getting from this is that this whole thing is temporary. Mm -hmm. To me, this secondary shield seems like a temporary threat that's going to kind of get in the way of Coulson and crew for a little bit, and if, if next week's show uh, teaser is any indication, this second shield will be gone by the end of the second season. <laughs> in fact, I think this is really just stretching the season out until we get back to Cal and his guys and the... Or I'm going to call the Forbidden City. I don't know where these guys are. Whatever the current Adelan is on Earth um, with the Inhumans. It just feels like filler to me. I mean, they've got great actors coming in. It was nice to see the, uh, the teacher from the S.H.I.E.L.D. school again. Uh, we haven't seen her since season one. But I really like what they're doing with Hunter. Let me say that first and foremost. I think the actor, Nick Blood, is doing a great job with Hunter. He's got some great character moments in this episode. Mm -hmm. But I really just don't care about how conflicted... Uh, well, Bobby's not even that conflicted, but the fact that I don't care that Bobby's teaming around with his other S.H.I.E.L.D. team, I don't care about what's going on with Mac with relevance with relation to this, yeah. I just want this storyline done. I want I want Nick Blood, uh, Hunter back with the regular S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, mm -hmm. I want this other S.H.I.E.L.D. out of the way, I just, I don't care, and it just yeah. feels like it's there to, to fill in episodes, frankly. Uh, if anything, it seems like they're using this storyline as a response to the fact that the rest of the world still thinks Nick Fury is dead. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we'll end up seeing Nick Fury again. Probably not. I don't think so. But if if we did, then I could see it being him needing to show up to be like, look, guys, like unify I put Coulson in charge. Yeah. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you I was still alive, mm -hmm. but knock it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, know, something to that effect. I hope it builds to that point if yeah. that's what they're doing. Um, Jay, what's your kind of thoughts on this? On this particular storyline, I just, I don't know. I, I have a feeling like they don't know what they're dealing with type. You know, they okay. just say like, oh, we didn't like Fury, we don't like Coulson, so we're going to start our own type deal. But Coulson and Fury know kind of the bigger, broader picture. They've dealt yeah. with the Avengers, they've dealt with, uh, you know, Hydra, they've dealt with a lot of other things. And so I think this kind of insurrection is just, it's a one-off type yeah, deal. What, yeah, what are these guys up to? We haven't even yeah. heard of these guys the whole season. Yeah. Like, what have they been doing since the fall of the shield? I yeah. mean, <laughs> how, how have we not run into these guys before? How come Talbot's not worried about these guys? Yeah. Like, how do they get a battleship? That's exactly, cool. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm really enjoying S.H.I.E.L.D. in Season 2. I feel like this is, frankly, just filler. That's yeah. kind of my takeaway from this. I'm ready to move on past the storyline. I feel like it's Season 3. By the second episode, this had never been mentioned again. Yeah. So, let's just... 
move on. Uh, yeah, I would agree. And uh, one thing that really strange is the way that Hunter was so sure that Bobby wouldn't betray yeah. the yeah. shield, and then she just walks in, and it's not really explained very well. Like, why? How did she get uh, organized with these people? How did she meet them? And exactly, why well, she was she... Uh, planned with Hydra yeah. supposedly yeah. since before that. The fall of Hydra. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, yeah. it, some of it just doesn't seem like it's been explained quite well enough yet, so mm -hmm. maybe we'll see more of that next week, or maybe it's we'll just... We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, and then the other thing we had going on this week, uh, there was a couple of things, Sky getting used to her powers, we don't really need to touch on that. Just know that she's in a cabin right now, until next week. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, the Agent 33, which we got a lot of development. I gotta say, man, uh, may not win convinced me that she was an entirely different person this episode. Yeah. Especially when we had all the S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff going on, she's dead serious and she's typical male like we expect. Mm -hmm. The other storyline we had going on was a very emotional, very open person who was very upset about what had happened to her. Yeah. So I appreciate the fact that while I was watching this other Melinda May, uh, well, this other Ming Na Win, that I totally bought into the fact that she was Agent 33. I never once thought I'm watching May on the screen just pretending to be someone else. And totally. she got her face back. She, she got her yeah, face back, so that's great. Back. So if anything, that may, might mean we won't see as much of May yeah. moving yeah, forward in the Agent 33 mask. Yeah. So, but I like that. Um, you know, it's good to see what Ward was up to. He's still being his, you know, crazy, creepy self. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> and Bakshi's still alive. And Bakshi's still alive, <laughs> which we yeah. kind of knew already, but I mean, he had been arrested or traded to Talbot, right? Yes. So, yeah, I mean, he, he didn't yes. die again since we learned he was still alive. It's just He's still alive. He's yeah, still right? Alive. He's just still so, there. Yeah. I, I think he's going to be a recurring thorn on the guy's side, but I kind of like Bakshi. I mean, for, he's just, he's one of those characters that you, he's a weasel. Yeah. And you got to have your weasel character show up, you know, to kind of disrupt things. They so. are brainwashing him. Yeah. So they, yeah, see right? What's going on we'll see what that. they do with that. Yeah. So, but um, I guess my impressions of S.H.I.E.L.D. are kind of lukewarm this week. I really like the A story. I don't really care so much about the B story. Uh, the C story with Ward and 33, though, I did kind of enjoy. And there was a nice Pulp, rec or pulp Fiction reference, you know, toward the yep. episode, so yeah. that, that was great. So And they got a little uh, uh, Avengers talk at the beginning with uh, Simmons and Fitz. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were talking about, like, Hulk and Captain America. And, and I like that Fitz was like. really yeah. pulling for, he was really trying to make uh, Simmons realize, like, uh, this is potentially our Captain America, you know? And she's like, well, I think we've got our Hulk. I kind of like that, <laughs> yeah. that conversation that they had going back yeah, and forth. Okay. So, well, let's move on then to uh, Arrow and Flash. Greg, what have you got to share with us? So I'll start with Flash since it actually airs first, but um, Flash this week, we got a reset of all the timeline stuff from last week. And basically, uh, as he basically uh, as a response to what happened uh, in the previous episode where there was a tsunami and he was gonna stop it, um, at the start of this week's episode, he decides to just stop, stop uh, Weather Wizard right away, just goes and grabs him, throws him in the pen, uh, and Harrison Wells warns Barry that this is not going to end well, that whenever you take away one catastrophe, the universe has a way of filling it in with a new one. Interesting. Um, so, Modelist nation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so at the same time, we then see Captain Cold and Heat Wave in the Santini crime family. They, they've been captured by them, I guess. Uh, they fight off all these gangsters, very incompetent gangsters. Um, <laughs> and then they kidnap Cisco and have him make them new guns again. Uh, they actually kidnapped him by using uh, Captain Cold's sister as like a plant. Uh, she came up to him at a bar and was like, oh, I'm really interested in you. And he's like, really? Me? <laughs> but, uh, then they bring him to the house and he ends up making her, I don't know what her role is, uh, like in the comics or anything, but he makes her a gun that shoots gold, basically. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's some character like that. Um, also, we had Barry breaking up with Linda and trying to start things with Iris because we learned last week that he knows that Iris loves him, but it didn't, right. it didn't work because she didn't have that tsunami, the catastrophe, the moment where she realized it too. So he's like talking to her like, I know you're into me. And she's like, uh, you're kind of creepy and I'm gonna leave. <laughs> <laughs> and then Eddie punches Barry and later uh, that gets all covered up by Caitlin trying to say that Barry has lightning psychosis which is this new condition they've invented to <laughs> shield uh, everyone from his condition. Um, but yeah, so Barry can travel through time now. Uh, he doesn't know, at least initially, uh, about Wells, but, and he actually, uh, on multiple occasions, Barry and then Wells and then just circumstance, stop Iris's boss in this version of the day from telling her about her, suspic her suspicions about Wells with Simon Stagg dying and all that. Um, and at the end of the episode, Harrison actually shows up and kills Mason Bridge. So now, Iris isn't going to know. But at the same time, 
Barry was about to ask Wells about uh, Simon Stagg because he got to relive the day, so he still had that info. And right when he's about to ask Harrison Wells on the screen in front of him, he sees reporter Mason Bridge killed. And he's like, I'm not going to ask Harrison about this after all. <laughs> and then goes to Joe and is like, I think you're right, basically. So now Barry is fully suspecting uh, Wells is a bad guy. Um, and that, I guess, is the result of the day. Also, we have, oh, yeah, and then uh, Captain Cold. So Barry, in stopping Captain Cold, uh, Captain Cold had to go uh, find Cisco and make him have him make the new weapons. Uh, part of that was he tortured Cisco's brother and forced Cisco to tell him who Barry is, who the Flash is, that he's Barry Allen. Okay. So when Barry is stopping Captain Cold, uh, Captain Cold threatens him. He's like, if you put me in your little cell, then I won't be able to stop my uplink that tells the whole world who you are. So Barry decides he has to let him go. Uh, and Barry says, uh, if, any, if you or anyone else in your rogues gallery decides to come after me again, hmm. or my family, I'm not going to let you do it. Name drop. Name drop. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, Barry leaves, and Captain Cole's standing there, and he's like, rogues. Cute. <laughs> <laughs> so that, we kind of saw the birth of the rogues this week. Yes. Um, and that's pretty much everything that happened to Flash, as I recall. Okay. Where is Grodd? Grodd. Well, we haven't seen him in a few episodes, and I'm still wondering. I think they're going to wait until season two on that and have him just be teased all of this season. Yeah. But yeah, so so far, I mean, I, I've said it, I've, I've uh, seen it said multiple times. We're still only in season one on The Flash. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's season one, and we've got Grodd, we've got the rogues, we've got Barry can travel through time, we've got the reverse Flash. We've got Iris finds out about him, but then the day reset. Like, there's just so much stuff that happens in this show. It's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got to move on to Arrow. So stuff happened in Arrow, too. At the beginning of the episode, we have Lila and Diggle getting remarried. Oh, um, okay. And, of course, Ray Palmer's a minister because he's just everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he performs their ceremony for them. Uh, and then from that point on, we have uh, basically two different episodes running side by side. Okay. So Diggle and Lila go to the airport to go on their honeymoon, and everybody else from Arrow stays in town. Why, when Diggle and Lila get to the airport, uh, Waller shows up and sends no, them no. on a mission. We so we have the return of the Suicide Squad. We have mm -hmm. Floyd Lawton shows up again. We have uh, Carrie Cutter, I think is her name. Cupid is her alias in the comics. But she shows up and she's part of their team. And in this episode, we actually have flashbacks with Floyd Lawton, which I think is the first time, and Stephen Mount mentioned this, but I think it's the first time we've ever had a flashback that wasn't Arrow. Arrow yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we had him, and we saw that he had a wife and a daughter but that after he went to the war, he kind of had PTSD or something. She wasn't able to handle it, and his wife, he lost his wife and his daughter. They didn't die, but he, he pulled a gun on them, and she called the cops, and they had to be separated, basically. So uh, throughout the course of the Suicide Squad mission, you have Diggle and Lila and uh, Cupid and uh, Deadshot, and they're all tracking down this guy, Senator Cray. I don't know if you guys know his name from comics. I don't know if he's even in the comics. But they were, it does sound familiar. Yeah, yeah, supposedly he was kidnapped and they were tracking him down. But when they finally find him, they realize that this was actually something orchestrated by Cray uh, to boost his public image because he wants to run for president. Hmm. So he was actually hired. He hired all these mercenaries to take a bunch of hostages, including himself. Um, and they end up having to take him down. Um, and it involves uh, Floyd Lawton staying behind and providing them cover fire while they get out of the building. And I think Cray gets away. Um, but then the building blows up, because uh, Cray was going to kill all the hostages, kill everyone inside. Um, but Lawton is actually left on top of the building when it explodes. And we're left thinking that Deadshot is dead. Um, I don't know how much I buy that, just because we didn't see a body. Yeah, we didn't yeah. see, you know, but that, that's where they left that, at least. Then, back in Starling City, um, Arrow is trying to track down his imposter, Ross Al Ghul, except it's, oh, yeah. now it's uh, Maceo is leading a group of little league guys who are dressing like Arrow. We got a cool fight with uh, Arrow fighting like two or three guys dressed as Arrow. Nice. Yeah, cool. um, were these league guys actually competent? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> More competent than last that's for sure. Um, but yeah, so uh, he, he fought some Arrow guys, and then uh, Ray Palmer, uh, totally not Iron Man, flying around in his <laughs> yeah. uh, sees through the wall and has the spatial recognition software and learns that Oliver Queen is the Arrow. So he confronts Felicity, 
Felicity goes back to Oliver, and Oliver's like, why didn't you tell me Ray has this super suit and wants to be a vigilante too? And she's like, I'm getting a lot of that today. <laughs> <laughs> but so uh, Oliver and Ray have a confrontation. Um, basically, at first, Ray doesn't believe Oliver that he's not a killer, uh, but then uh, Oliver kind of stops. He, he throws this thing at Ray's suit that disables the power, mm -hmm. and Ray pulls his helmet off. He's like, go ahead and kill me. And Oliver's like, I'm not going to kill you. Maybe now you'll understand. And he, uh, then he goes back to, Ray goes back to Felicity and is like, yeah, you're right. Uh, so now they know. Um, and then Ray goes to the police office, uh, or mayor's office, rather, at the end. Um, and he's trying to convince them that Oliver's not a bad guy. And one of the arrow imposters shoots the mayor with an arrow oh, right gosh. there in front of them. Here we go. So yeah, that was uh, This Week on Arrow. I don't think I forgot anything, but yeah. OK. So still needs to work on that PR. Yeah. Sort of, so yeah. maybe we're still moving towards the, uh, the Green Arrow. And I don't think you were here all, or last week, JT, when we were talking about it. Uh, people ask Stephen Amell at Planet Comic Con when he's going to get the goatee, when he's going to be called Green Arrow. Yeah. And he didn't really answer directly. He just said, you know, for now, that's not happening. So, yeah. All right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it seems like it's been discussed on the show and possibly, and we were kind of mentioning this too, it seems like as Flash is getting very heavy into Supernatural, as mm -hmm. Ray Parker is, Ray Parker, no, Palmer, yeah. Palmer, Ray Palmer, as he's going to get his own television series next fall, as Arrow's moving forward, it seems like the television Justice League are happening. I suspect that Green Arrow will be named Green Arrow by the end of season two, yeah. three. So as everything starts next year for all the shows, including Supergirl that's starting up, yes. we've got full-on comic book heroes across the board. Wow. So What are they going to do with Batman and Gotham? Though? Yeah, that's well, then see, that's not even in the same universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so, the problem. Yeah, so, that's just I just sad. think there's not going to be a Batman. I think Arrow is Batman. I, okay. Right now, yeah. Arrow is Batman. <laughs> yeah. So... All right, so uh, sounds like some pretty good stuff yeah. on Arrow and Flash. I think next week I'm actually going to have a chance to catch up on at least Arrow or Flash, so I'll be able to talk to you about Very that as well. Stuff. Let's move on to gaming news. A uh, quick hit we want to mention on gaming news is that Arkham Knight has been delayed again, but don't get angry yet. Uh, instead of being a, you know, a year later or whatever, uh, it's actually just going to be uh, 21, days. 21 days. Yeah, yeah. so it's going from June 2nd to June 23rd. Yeah. So uh, They've given me 21 days in which to play Arkham City. There you go, yeah, so that's exactly yeah. what they've done. So uh, be just be mindful of that moving forward, guys. If you were planning on the 2nd or asked off work like I did, uh, you have to uh, maybe get that day changed. So uh, then moving on, I want to give uh, continuing impressions of the Family Guy Star Trek game. Last week, we found out about the crossover, the promotional deal with Star Trek content showing up in the Family Guy mobile game. We all downloaded the Family Guy mobile game. Or I think we're all at different places in that mobile game. Um, I have honestly probably put 50 hours into this mobile game already. I think you and I are definitely spending the most time yeah, on it. You yeah, you guys have got me. <laughs> so, you, like about halfway through, like halfway between now and last week, uh, Riker showed up for both of us. Yeah. And it wasn't until last night for me that I actually even got to the Enterprise. And two nights ago for me that I got to the Enterprise. And so, I, yeah. I gotta say, man, like first of all, just from a Family Guy standpoint, the, uh, the Ron Jones music that's playing in the city is really nice. Um, the aesthetic of the game is really awesome. I like the, the references of all the different jobs you have people doing, different costumes you can unlock are specific to episodes. The Family Guy license is being used very well, and I love the voice work that's being done by all the characters. Oh, yeah. All of that love and attention carries over to the Star Trek content once yep. you get there. All the sound effects from Star Trek are there. Ron the, Jones music on the Enterprise. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds just like the first three seasons of Star Trek as far as music is concerned. Um, all the, it just, everything is perfect. Like, I'm having so much fun, even though I'm doing a lot of grindy sort of tasks in this game, because it's basically The Sims. Um, I'm really, really loving the Star Trek content. Right now, I'm trying to get Geordi unlocked. Yeah. Uh, there's just, there's a lot to enjoy about this game. Now, I will also mention, too, um, because Jade mentioned that this game is very similar to Simpsons Tap Out. Yeah. I went ahead and downloaded Simpsons Tap Out last week, and I've been playing that concurrently with the Family Guy game. So I've noticed that uh, playability-wise, I definitely like the Family Guy game more, but I think the Simpsons game has it better as far as city layout's concerned. It's way easier to manage your pieces and your people and move things around on the map in the Simpsons game than it is in the Family Guy game. In fact, that sometimes in the same Family Guy game, if I've got to move a building, I give up on trying to drag the building. I scroll the screen over and the building's forced to drag along with the yeah, screen. That. So that is not a problem at all in Family Guy. So if I had, or in Simpsons. So if I had any complaints about the game at all, it's definitely um, just the, the functionality of it, I guess. Uh, but overall, really, really enjoying the content. I'm really glad I got to the Star Trek aspect of things. Uh, Greg, what are your impressions so far? I would agree, and I, I said this to you earlier, but I'm actually considering putting some money into it. So How about that, right? <laughs> yeah, I haven't done it yet, but 
there, there are some things, and mostly just because of the, the time crunch. Right, it's we've like, got 30 days basically at this yeah. point. So the, t the time is ticking, and I'd love to get more of that Star Trek content unlocked. Also, Worf seems to be so far a premium character that you have to pay clans for, mm -hmm. which hopefully that changes, but if that doesn't change, then that will be <laughs> time the only way. Yeah. yeah. So, so, all right, yeah, yeah and JT, uh, your exposure to Still the Still having fun. It is a bit, I mean, with the my, my job doing uh, video games retail, it. I can't really get to playing on a tablet or on a phone as much as I would like to. Sure. Um, with customer interaction and everything, but um, just hearing like Jordy talk on your game was so cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was really a nice uh, Captain Planet reference. Yeah, 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 that was awesome. Just hearing like the like little Easter eggs they kind of hid in the game was really cool. And I, I'm gonna definitely be playing more. I just have to have, find the time. And like usually a lot of my time after work is spent on console gaming. So, sure, sure. So me and mobile gaming uh, sometimes we conflict, but. Like, when I'm in the airport or anything, I'll definitely be putting my time in that and Marvel Puzzle Quest, so... Well, we'll definitely... Oh, you, you mentioned also that, really, the game does expect you to have a lot more done to really... Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I don't think we were supposed to jump on last week no. and not have anything unlocked <laughs> in the game. To enjoy that. We had to grind a lot to be able to yeah. get to level 3 Kohog or whatever it is to be able... To, and yeah, That's just when it starts, you know? And it's like, there's going to be stuff that we're not even going to see, probably, because it'll be level 8 or 9 Kohog. Exactly, yeah. we're so. not going to have enough time. The so. good thing I did like hearing you, Greg, was when you said you were willing to spend money on it. Yeah. That's mobile game plan. Oh, right. yeah, 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 that's what they try to get you to do. Well, and year. I respect all the effort and work that they put into really providing a good Star Trek experience. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's it's what I wanted. Yeah, so, exactly, yeah. Yeah, my only downside is just the... So, some things don't work as well as they could, which we've already kind of addressed. The, yeah, The placement yeah. of the building, stuff like that, and yeah. So... All right, well, um, oh, I should mention, too, as a comparison to the Simpsons game, it seems like it's way easier to earn money in the Simpsons game. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't gone and built, like, money farms like you have in Family Guy with just buildings lined up that are generating. <laughs> but, like, as, playing both games at the same time, I have progressed a lot quicker in the Simpsons game, and I've earned money a lot faster in the Simpsons game than I have in Family Guy. So I don't fault the Family Guy game for that. I think it's just handling things differently, but it's just an interesting observation, I think, between the two, especially when the games are very similar to each other. All right, so uh, moving on to the console game side of things, uh, Jerry, why don't you tell us what came out this week? Uh, Bloodborne hit PlayStation 4 this week on Tuesday. Uh, very good game, made by From Software, published by Sony. Um, I enjoy the crap out of this game. I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, it is in line with the Demon Souls, Dark Souls um, kind of franchise. Uh, gameplay is very hard. You will die. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the, the general concept of the game. Um, is you're kind of doing a lot of body running where you're when you die you come back you go back to your body pick up all your um, this time it's blood shards I believe um, the game is amazing uh, it plays very fluent the characters are very good um, it's got a really cool art style it's all gothic kind okay. of feeling um, instead of like the medieval kind of style that they did before so um, you have this kind of like excess like Victorian style uh, gothic uh, feel to the game which is good um, you end up this time around not having a shield so there oh. there isn't any blocking in the game mm -hmm. um, when you start the game out you you get a, a melee weapon and your choice of a, um, a ranged weapon. So you get either a shotgun or a pistol. So basically there's lots of dodge rolling. Lots of dodge rolling. <laughs> lots of dodge rolling. Yeah. Um, and learning how to parry is kind of the key to not having oh, okay. a shield. So if you can parry an enemy's attack, then you can kind of uh, win over on battles a lot, a lot more. Uh, but the key is uh, getting into a battle, dying, coming back, and saying, okay, I won't do that again. I'll try something different. Um, the cool thing I do like about this game this time around um, that uh, Dark Souls and Demon Souls don't have is when you take damage, um, you actually don't die instantly. Uh, you have kind of a, a timer uh, on your on your health bar that goes down. If you actually attack the enemy that attacked you first, it stops the the depletion of your of your life hmm. and it ends up being that that point. Um, and, and then you can actually attack more and gain more life, which is really cool. Yeah, it's kind of a new take on. On fighting this time around, of course, you have the short stamina bar that you get to do maybe two attacks and then you have to like back up, roll, 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 and then yeah. and do that again. But the game is really good. Um, it's polished beautifully. I love the PS4 hardware and what it can do. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I, I'm hoping to get into some multiplayer aspects of the game. I haven't gotten to do that quite yet because okay. I kind of want to play single player first sure. and then get into that. But I'm, I'm enjoying it. I would definitely recommend it. Uh, if I would uh, range it out of 10, I would probably give it 8.5, 9 out of 10. Where you're at right now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Story-wise, I know Demon Souls and Dark Souls weren't really known for the story. You kind of had to read it along the way if you wanted it. Is it yeah. the same sort of take with Bloodborne? Um, not really, actually. Bloodborne actually kind of jumps you right in. You get, you create your character, and all of a sudden you are on this doctor's table, and he's like, "Are you ready?" And you're kind of like, "Yeah." Uh, <laughs> and he puts this. Um, it, I don't know if it's a spell or if it's a potion that he kind of infuses into your blood. Um, I would kind of liken it to like Scarecrow from Batman. He's not uh, like it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're talking like about a supernatural game. Yeah, like yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> I, I would like I I would uh, kind of compare it to um, Scarecrow uh, from Batman, and you kind of okay. have this like otherworldly experience out of an out of body experience, and then all of a sudden. You are you're kind of in this weird, strange world, and you don't know what's going on. But you you know this old man has something to do with it, and then you hear a female's voice, and she's like, "Oh, you found another hunter," and you're like, "Oh my God, who is that? Why?" And so I I, I got a feel that the story is going to progress as you okay. as you go along. Where where Dark Souls and Demon Souls was just like, "Hey, yeah, you're dead. Go fight this demon king." <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. Sure. Yeah. So and that. There really wasn't a story that it kind of involved with those where you, like you sure. said, you'd have to read it more sure. than you would. But this game, actually, I, I have a feeling that as you get deeper into the game, it's going to unfold more. Okay, stories. so it's, it's a draw for you then. This yeah, okay. oh yeah, definitely. Well, good then. So, well then, I guess, let's get to what we're playing this week. Would you say that you're Bloodborne, basically? That's what you're playing? I'm in Bloodborne. All right. <laughs> um, and then my ultimate game would still be Dragon Ball Z Xenoverse. All right, uh, yeah. You have, you have to go online every now and again and just punch somebody in the yeah, face. Yeah, of so. course, yeah, man. <laughs> so... Awesome. Well, awesome. Um, I guess what I'm playing this week is definitely the Family Guy Get Stuff. Right. Uh, I'm doing The Simpsons too, but I'm definitely focused on the Family Guy. We're still playing Marvel Puzzle Quest, I think, all three of us. Getting the yes. Yes. Yeah, getting yes. the daily awards. Uh, still, guys, uh, join us at Cerebro616. That's the alliance that we're part of. You're welcome to send us a request if you want to join us. Um, but then, that, I guess that's what all of our games are for the week so yeah. far. So let's go ahead and hit up the pick of the, pick of the week. We're going to start with me. My pick of the week is actually Nightcrawler number 12. Uh, Nightcrawler is a book series that was started about this time last year uh, with X-Men writer Chris Claremont and artist Todd Nock. Uh, Nock, I don't think, has done a Marvel book before. If he has, I'm not familiar with what it was. But Claremont, of course, is famous for Days of Future Past, Phoenix Saga, tons of storylines. You know, he was the guy that, from the first issue after Giant Size number one all the way through to X-Men number three in 1991, wrote basically every X-Men story, and he's contributed to books throughout that. So it was really great to get Nightcrawler's, essentially Nightcrawler's father, writing the book. Uh, and it was kind of a nice touch, and I enjoyed the artwork all the way through. The book's getting canceled, frankly, because of sales, but it, it's been a fun ride. Uh, we've gotten some great backstory with Nightcrawler. He went back to the circus and met up with his family. He fought some guys in, uh, in Germany, and then he had uh, Shadow King show up and had some pretty cool adventure with Psylocke and, and Colossus and a lot of the, again, the classic characters that Chris Claremont helped shape. So I enjoyed the book for what it was. Honestly, at the end of its run, with the exception of maybe the death of the Wolverine uh, issue that came out in the middle of everything, most of the story stuff is probably going to be inconsequential and never mentioned again. But it was still a really fun book, and I'm sorry to see it go. So that's my pick of the week. If you guys haven't checked out this series, check out issue 12. Definitely go back and check out the death of Wolverine tie-in, or maybe even start at issue 1. You can still find them in the back issues, and just read that entire run. It should be a fun read for you guys. So, uh, Greg, what's your pick of the week? Well, I don't know if this is cheating because it's not like part of our usual roster, but I really enjoyed Better Call Saul this week. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. there you go. I thought that uh, we got to, it was really the first time we got to see Saul be a serious lawyer, and he got to team up with his brother, Chuck McGill, so, who's played by Michael McKean. Oh, nice. Who I love. Um, and, yeah, it was just a really very good episode. Uh, a couple weeks ago they had what I thought was their best episode yet, and this week they topped it again, so I'm just really pleased with where that show is right now. And, yeah. Well, great. And what's your pick of the week? Um, my pick of the week is uh, Batman Arkham Knight number one. Um, oh, the comic book series. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that is actually, I think that launched this week, and um, that's going to lead up into Arkham Knight, the actual game. So I'm excited to see kind of a preview of what's going to happen in Arkham Knight. So, oh, awesome. Yeah, that's my pick of the week. Well, maybe we need to be covering that yeah. on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah man, we'll do so. that. Good time. All right, guys, so that's everything we've got for you this week. Thanks for joining us again. Again, uh, you can hit Greg up on Twitter at Yoshimitsu47. I'm at D21Beast. And Big Nice 33 All right, so yeah, hit us up on Twitter. Definitely check us out, Cerebro616 on Marvel Puzzle Quest if you want to join with us, help us build our army. Uh, thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next week.